keep the lights a little brighter. I don't know why they're dimming the lights here for. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want to I, I, I wanna minister to you. I want to help you understand the importance of why we as believers need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And today, in some places, he's unknown. In some places, he's not even wanted. In some places, it's offensive to talk about him. Not with me. And you got to understand who he is. And I've come to this conclusion after all the years I've been ministering. I'll tell you who he is. He is Jesus Unlimited. That's the best way to describe him. He's the Lord without limit. Now, are you people in the choir? Is this choir? Most of them? Yeah. I'm going to ask you some questions later, so be prepared. <laughs> but I, 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 ju I just want to point something out to you real quick, like headlines. And I want you to pay attention, especially you guys who are the ushers. The worst people sometimes to receive are security guys that aren't even in the spirit, so you guys are, are okay. Thank God for that. I've been known to move people off the front seat and put them somewhere else. I don't have to see them, but so you guys behave. <laughs> when the Lord walked the earth, when the master walked this earth, people saw his mighty power. They heard his amazing life-changing messages, but not one person was changed. Not one individual ever said to the Lord, what must I do to be saved? Why? Because the Holy Spirit was not yet on the earth. Think about they saw him heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers. Not one of them felt his presence. Not one of them. Because the Holy Spirit wasn't on the earth. So no one could feel anything. Even when Jesus healed the sick and said, virtue had gone out of me. I believe that woman with this of blood felt something. But nothing changed her own heart. Think about all the disciples saw. Think about all the apostles experienced. And when the Lord was on the cross, they all forsook him. They all Walked away and said, ah, we thought he was the Son of God. Questioning whether he was the Messiah. And think just, if you just allow yourself, let this sink in your heart. Here's Peter the Apostle. Here's John. Here's James. Who saw him transfigured. Think about standing before a man and you see his face change right in front of your eyes. You see his clothing become brighter, brighter than bright and whiter than white. Think you were there and saw Elijah the prophet talk to him and Moses. And you saw the cloud of glory and heard the voice of God say, this is my son. And then a few weeks later, you question whether he's the Messiah. That's staggering. Or a man who walked on the water named Peter denies him. Why? No Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, these men could not live right. They had the will. Oh Lord, we're going to all die with you. And then they ran away. Why? No power. They had the will to do it, but no power to carry it. One of the most staggering, I think most staggering portions in the Gospels is one little line in Matthew, the last part of the Gospel. Jesus raised from the dead. He's standing in the upper room and it says, some doubted. What? Some doubted. It doesn't tell us who the some were. I can guess. 
How can they doubt? No Holy Spirit. They saw him raise the dead and question his own resurrection. Did not even understand it when he talked about it. He would minister the word and they said, hmm, I wonder what he's talking about. Why? No Holy Spirit. He talked about the cross and hmm, I don't think I know what. Why? No Holy Spirit. He's going down from the Mount of Transfiguration talking about the cross and they're all puzzled like, what is he talking about? Why would they question? St. Paul. There's a wonderful, wonderful scripture. It's not by might. Think about all the might they saw. Think all the might displayed. When Jesus calmed the storm, boy, that was might. When he cast out demons, that was might. When he, he raised Lazarus from the dead, that's power. What does it say? It's not by might or power. It's by my spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no Christian life. Yet today you have people who don't want him. They're in danger of losing everything. Christianity is not a religion. It's a revelation. And the Holy Ghost, the great revealer, without him, there's no faith. Jesus the Master gave us the greatest gift he could give us. The Holy Spirit. And then he declared this. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses. Now, he gave the Holy Spirit in the upper room before his ascension. <sighs> Receive the Holy Ghost. And at that moment, in the Gospel of John, they were saved, born again. Later, they were empowered for service. But this blessed Holy Spirit, who is he? Well, let me just talk about him for a little bit. I would not be who I am. I would not even be in the ministry had it not been for Catholic woman back in 73 who introduced me to that amazing person. It, but it's been a long time now. I've learned a whole lot more than what Catherine ever taught me. The Holy Spirit, not only is he the Spirit of the Lord, and when we say he's the Spirit of the Lord, then it's quite simple to know also he's no stranger. We know him. Jesus said, you know him. Why? Because he's the same one I am, is what he meant. I shall give you another comforter. The Greek says, one just like me. Exact copy. Well, you know, I don't really understand. Well, it's time you do understand that. The Trinity is not complicated. I'm a Trinity. You're a Trinity. That's not complicated. Would you all say after me, I'm a spirit. I am not a soul. And I'm not a body. I am a spirit. So what are you? Say that. I am a what? Well, so is God. Now, you have a soul. You're not a soul. You have one. So say, I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. Well, that's all you are. Well, that's a trinity. It's a shadow, but it's still a trinity. The sun, that's a trinity. Sun, light, heat, same thing. God has given examples on this earth of who he is. You, you look at the sun itself. The sun is just like the Father, and the light is Jesus, and the heat is the Holy Ghost. Simple, really, stuff to me anyways. But we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, a person means one with intellect, one with emotion, one with will. Personality means what I think, what I feel, and what I want. That's personality. So anybody who says I'm a person is one who thinks, feels, and wants. Simplicity. 
The Holy Spirit is a person. Angels are not persons. No angel has ever said, I'm a person. Why? Because they have no soul. Are they not ministering spirits? The scripture says so. An angel is a spirit with a spirit body that can manifest as flesh and not be recognized as, as an angel. Yet that angel is not a person. God is a person. God the Father is a person. God the Father has his own intellect, his own will, his own emotions. God the Father is a complete person, separate from the Son. God the Son is a person. Intellect, will, emotions. He is the only member of the Godhead in a human body. For he became flesh, remember that. He did not take upon himself the form of an angel. He took upon himself the form of flesh. And that's another marvelous mystery. And then you have the Holy Spirit. Again, a person. God the Father has a body. Absolutely, he has. He has shape. Jesus said to the Jews, you have not seen his shape. So he has shape. The children of Israel saw his feet in Exodus. On a blessed sea of glass mingled with fire. Moses saw his hand. Moses saw his back. Oh, I wish I can talk about that now. God the Father is not invisible to the human eye. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. The pure in heart shall see God. God Almighty will be seen. Stephen said, I saw the glory of the Lord. Well, the glory of the Lord is the Lord. The glory of the Lord is not some mist. It is the Lord. And then Jesus, the Word who became flesh, He is the only member in a, in, a, in a human body. And all that God is, is revealed in Christ Jesus. He is the full revelation of what God is. That's what it, it means by the Word was made flesh. That's what... The, the, the word means revelation. So the revelation became a man. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what the Father is like, look at Jesus. You want to know what the Son is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what the Holy Spirit is like? Look at Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are you with me so far? Now, the Holy Spirit is the power of the Trinity. So, when God decided, and every time you see the Father, He is the decision maker. He's the boss. He's the great boss. Everything in heaven is His idea. Salvation, His idea. The creation of the world, His idea. Man, His idea. Let us make man after our image. His idea. So God the Father is the one who speaks. Every time you see God, He's always speaking. The Father is always speaking. He's always the great chief, the big boss, I call Him. I love that. The Son, the Word, ever shall be the Word, is the doer in the Godhead. He's the administrator of heaven. He's the one who makes it happen. So when God said, let us make man, it was Jesus who squeezed that shape of God into the shape of the Lord himself. Mud. Think about the Lord on his knees squeezing mud together. He's the doer. By him all things were made. Now the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. He's the power behind it all. So when God breathed on that mud in Genesis, it turned into what? Flesh, blood, bone. The Holy Spirit is the, is, the, is the power. So God says, I'm going to save Cynthia or I'm going to save Mary. Well, Jesus is the one who saves. Jesus is the one who did it. But the Holy Spirit is the one who manifests that salvation in us. Or when God will heal you, even though he already healed us and saved us, by the way. But just to make it simple, if God ever decides to heal someone, which he often does. It's the Father who wills it. It's the Son who 
does it and the Holy Ghost manifests that in that body. Are you still with me? Now, the Holy Spirit not only is the power of the Trinity. He's a mighty wind and a gentle wind. He's a mighty wind and a gentle breeze. We see in the scriptures where he's the one who conceived the master. He's the one who came upon Mary. The angel Gabriel said, On the part of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing within thee is the Son of God. So, in Matthew 1, 18 says that Jesus was conceived by the Spirit. Now, I want to show you how important he was and still is and ever shall be in the life of Jesus. They're going to stagger you. Are you people able to handle some good meat? Like you want some good something to chew on. Well, you better lift your hands and ask God to help you get it. Because if, if, you, don't, uh, if you don't ask him to help you, I cannot help you. All right. Now, if you, the, you that go to this church, I'm very sure you get some good Holy Ghost meat. But people that go to other churches, only God knows what they're getting. And I don't want to see them choke. Some are so accustomed to skim milk and been skim milk for so long. It's time to get some good Holy Ghost filet mignon. Let me hear an amen. amen. Okay, now, in, you, you people ask for it. In eternity past, God Almighty had a conference. In that conference, he, he made a covenant with himself. That's what it's, it means by, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. God Almighty, in that conference, the Son was crucified. So what, what do you mean? Well, the Bible says Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. So before God ever created man, or angels, or heavens, or the earth, or anything, before there was angels or devils, that's another subject because devils are the pre-Adamic pre race that lived here, but I don't want to mess your head right now. Before anything was ever created, pay attention now, if you lose it, it's your fault. Before anything was ever created, God, I am, I am, and I am, had a meeting. Because God was not yet the Father because there was no Son. So God... Let's just still call him Father, Son, Holy Spirit, even though he was not the Father and there was no Son because Jesus was not the Son till he became flesh. Huh? So he the Word. In the, in, the, in the beginning was the Word, right? So God Almighty and God Almighty and God Almighty had a meeting. And in that meeting, they decide who will be saved. It's called predestination. They write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus is crucified in that conference. You say, what do you mean? Well, he was crucified first in the heart of God. When God spoke it, it happened. Don't try to figure that one out, all right? All that the Bible says is he, he, he was crucified before the foundation of the world. It means before time before the earth, before anything happened, before anything created, Jesus already paid the price. Wow. How? Because God spoke it into being. He was crucified first in the heart of God. That's why the blood of animals, when God looked at the blood of animals in the old covenant, he didn't see the blood of animals. He saw the blood of Christ already shed in his heart. You people said you want to go deep. So here we go. In that conference, not only did the Lord, not only was he crucified in that conference, not only did he plan our salvation and planned who would be saved, by the way. And the Lord added, such as should be saved. Nobody gets saved just because it's an accident. God is not sitting in glory with a big pen and a big book, and everyone sometimes, and, and, and every time someone comes on an aisle, God writes his name. No, no, no. They come down because their names are in already. He has chosen us before the foundation of the world. 
Jim, is that guy standing or is in my eyes? Huh? He's in a chair. Okay. That'll be nice. Be glad I'm not your pastor. It's all right. It's all right. So in that amazing conference, God plans our salvation, plans who will be saved, ordains it before the foundation of the world. He who knows the end from the beginning plans it all. When Adam sinned, it didn't take God by surprise. When Lucifer became the devil, there was no surprise either. God knew it all from the start. Everything according to the pleasure of his will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One of these days, all will be revealed, and you're going to praise him forever for his wisdom. To know that you were chosen before the foundation of the world. That will cause your heart to be in flames with love. And at that moment, God Almighty looked at his son and said, For this plan to work, you would have to become flesh. You would have to disrobe yourself of your form. And I think at that moment, even though I wasn't there, I can just see it happening. The Lord must have looked at the Father and said, just a second, Father. Holy Spirit, for that to work, you would have to come with me. And the Holy Ghost said, we'll both go. For it was the Holy Spirit's power who reduced the eternal one into a seed. That's power. If the Holy Spirit can take God and turn him into a seed, think what he can do with you. Think what he can do with your life. And the word, God himself, became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. That which we've seen, that which we've heard, that which our hands have handled, the very word of life, John wrote. He who is life became a seed. He who is power became a seed. He who is mercy, grace, and glory became a seed. And the longings, the songwriter said, and the longings and the searchings became Mary's little son. Wow. You don't need the Bible when you're in heaven. You're going to see the Bible. You will not need to take your Bible to glory. He'll be right there to meet you. He is the living word. And this blessed Jesus became flesh by the power of the Holy Ghost. And the spirit of the Lord and the power of the highest shall come upon thee, Gabriel said. The Holy Spirit came upon the virgin, conceived in her body, he who is. And when she became the mother of God, no, 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 she didn't hold him. He was holding her. He who is was in her. And now he was born in Bethlehem, experiencing full growth, not like Adam. Adam was created a full man. Jesus, a seed in a woman's womb. And now when he's nine months old, he's born in Bethlehem. The perfect word of God. The child of the Holy Ghost. That's what Gabriel said to Mary. The child of the Holy Ghost. Right on schedule. The blood that flowed through his body. Perfect. Pure. Sinless. No, I don't believe in the Immaculate Conception. Anyone who believes in the Immaculate Conception is a fool. I grew up Catholic and they taught that theology. Impossible. 
Jesus, the only man, the only human being that ever lived a sinless life. His mother Mary was a sinner. She herself said it. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. The fact she calls him Savior, she's a sinner. I don't know why the Catholic Church doesn't see that. Anyone who calls God my Savior needs to be saved. She called her own son my Savior. God miraculously kept his blood pure. Think about this just for a minute. The miracle it took. Where did the blood come from? Well, let's ask this first. Let's go back to Adam. Where did his blood come from? He sure didn't have a mama. Didn't have a daddy. His blood came straight from heaven. How? The breath of God. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. And when God breathed through those nostrils, blood flowed right through his body. Therefore, the blood is the result of breath. That's why the blood of Jesus has power. Because every time you say the blood of Jesus, the breath shows up. The breath of the Holy Ghost is there. Because where the blood is, the breath is. Where the blood is, the Holy Ghost is. And the Holy Ghost is the breath. I'm not going too deep for you, am I? Ooh, let's go a little deeper. You better lift your hands and say, Lord, help me just a little more. Come on. All right, you asked for it. Never forget, never forget, that the blood in the Old Testament had to be applied seven times. Every day of atonement, the blood was applied seven times on the Ark of the Covenant. On the altar outside, the altar of sacrifice. And everything in the Word of God is a revelation of Jesus. Everything. I didn't know this when I began preaching. The greatest revelation God ever gave me as a minister is that the Bible is a revelation of one person and one person only, and his name is Jesus. God reveals his son through every shadow, through every type. Adam. When Adam was, was put to sleep, what was that but the death of Christ? When God opened his side, what was that but what happened to the master? When God took a bone out of his ribs. What was that but the church? Everything that happened to Joseph. Life of Christ. Loved by his father. Hated by his brothers. So just like Jesus. Put into a pit. That's the death of Christ. Into a prison. That's the underworld. Coming out of prison. That's the resurrection. Being given power to sit at Pharaoh's right hand. That's like Jesus sitting in God's right hand. And given a Gentile wife. That's the church. The whole story of Joseph. How many times can you read Joseph till you get bored to death? But when you see Jesus, there's no boredom. It's all about Jesus. Or the tabernacle, all about Jesus. Or the feast, all about Jesus. Even the life of Daniel. I'm, I'm studying the life of Daniel. I'm blown away how God revealed Jesus through Daniel. Or Isaac. Incredible. They don't teach you that in Bible school. Only the Holy Ghost can, can, can show you things like that. Everything. Such depth. The ark of Noah landing on the mountains of Ararat. Seventh month. Seventeenth day. The exact hour Jesus rose from the dead. Now how on earth can you deny Jesus being revealed even through the ark of Noah? The exact moment of the resurrection revealed in the story of the ark for he is the ark of safety you say where you get that right here why, do, why don't you read it quit watching the olympics <laughs> and who cares about trump and hillary just give me Jesus and I'm all happy. 
I have news for you. I don't care. I don't care who's going to win the elections. I know who already won. He's on the throne and all is well. This whole world is going to blow up anyways. But we are not of it. We are in it, but not of it. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. I'm proud to be a Christian. Who cares about what passport you carry? On my passport, it says citizen of the kingdom of God. That's all I want. Lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Never forget, people. Never, never forget to whom you belong. You're not only as... Who cares about your earthly citizenship? The Bible, the Bible. Get to know the Bible. This wonderful, wonderful Savior. Oh. Mm. Lift your hands and say, I love you with all my heart. <laughs> revelation after revelation of him in the Old Covenant. The early church, the early church did not have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They didn't have Acts and Romans and the epistles. They had to find him in Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. They had to find him in Joshua and Judges. Find him in Ruth and First. They had to find him in the books of the, uh, uh, the historical books and the prophets. How? Types, shadows, and a whole lot more. God made a covenant that blessed eternal covenant with himself. By myself have I sworn, said the Lord. There he planned your salvation and the Holy Ghost comes right on schedule. And that blessed precious blood that came through the breath of the Holy Ghost that breathed upon the Virgin Mary. That precious blood was shed seven times to fulfill Old Testament types. It was shed first in Gethsemane when his precious blood was poured out of his own body. When his sweat becomes blood in Gethsemane for the healing of my life and emotions and soul. Then the blood was shed the second time in the house of Caiaphas when they beat his precious face and pulled his beard off his face. Fulfilling Isaiah 60, Isaiah 50, verse 6, they pulled off the beard. Fulfilling Isaiah 52, 14, he was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. The face of Jesus was so marred and so disfigured as a human being, he wasn't even recognizable. Whatever that fellow's name that did that movie, he tried. Mel Gibson. He failed in his description of the true reality of what happened to the master. More than any man. Marred more than any man. His face was so disfigured. So disfigured. That's why Mary Magdalene did not recognize him when he rose from the dead. Because the last time she saw him he didn't even look human. No beauty in him we should desire is the way Isaiah described it. Why was this? Why did it happen? Why was the blood shed like that? For the healing of your image and my image that one day we shall look like him. He paid for it already. The third time the blood was shed was on the praetorium before Pilate. After examining him and finding no fault. Gave him over to their will. And they placed a crown of thorns upon his lovely head. And the blood was shed the third time for the healing of my mind and your mind. That one day you can say, I have the mind of Christ. Yeah. The fourth time the blood was shed is when they whipped his back. The Romans back then would use cruel instruments to torment those who were criminals. And he was declared to be a criminal by the Roman authorities. The whips that they used back then had 20 to 30 leather strips on. On each strip, Jan, they would place little metal balls with little holes in them. They would 
put them through that strip and tie a knot here, a knot there, and every ball had nails on it. Think about hundreds of little balls would roll and pull the flesh right off. The Lord was whipped with such a whip till his bones were exposed. That's why the psalmist said, I may tell all my bones. Jesus was completely torn apart. Take, eat my broken body, he said. That body was broken and torn for you and I. Why? With his stripes I'm healed. Do you know what it cost him to pay for your health? Pain that you cannot describe. Torn apart by that whip. And the blood was shed again when they nailed his hands to the cross. Why? That my work might be accepted. That's why. Then they nailed his feet. Why? That my walk might be secured. Nobody can stay Christian without the blood keeping you walking. Amen. That's why I'm still here. There's power in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. To even keep you walking with the Lamb. Amen. Then they tore his side with a spear that the church might be born. And that precious blood, what is so amazing to me is that blood was shed in different locations. Shed in Gethsemane. Shed in the house of Caiaphas. Even, I think, on the way to the house of Caiaphas. Shed from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium, Gregory. Think about the blood was, was, was coming out of his body while he was walking to the house of Caiaphas. And while going from the house of Caiaphas to the praetorium. Think about all the blood he lost, Jim, on the way to Golgotha. Carrying that heavy cross. Rubbing against his own bones. Jesus was a man of a man to have lasted that long. Think about the loss of all that blood for all those hours. The blood began to be shed in Gethsemane and did not stop to be shed till he cried, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken? What is staggering to me is Hebrews 9.12. With his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. I think, who gave it to him? Who collected every drop? Who collected every precious holy drop from the grounds of Gethsemane and on the way to the house of Caiaphas? Who collected every drop of blood on the floors of the house of Caiaphas? Who collected the blood on the way to the praetorium and in the praetorium and on the way to Golgotha and on Golgotha but the Holy Ghost? No angel would have had the, would have even been given that authority to carry that precious blood and give it to Jesus before his entry into glory. The Holy Spirit conceived him and the Holy Spirit anoints him at the river Jordan before his crucifixion. But think about all I said. Actually happened before the foundation of the world. All that happened in the heart of God Almighty. That's why when God saw the blood of animals, he didn't see the blood of animals. He saw the blood of Christ already shed. And right on schedule. Dear God, now you're all listening. I can see it. Earlier, some, some of you were somewhere else. On schedule, the Holy Ghost shows up at the River Jordan. There, the Son of God is baptized. That is one of the most powerful acts of love you can talk about. Because what people don't realize is baptism belongs to sinful men, not to those who are not sinful men. Baptism doesn't belong to the angels. When you get baptized, you declare, I'm a sinner. Jesus identifies with sinners in their act. And the moment he's baptized, he declares, I am one of them. And I want to identify with them. Even to take upon myself their, their sins and their stains. And that's why, that's why the anointing came upon him. 
Pastor Gary, I saw something in the Bible one day, just blew my head off. How God told Moses in the Old Testament to put leaven in the bread on the day of Pentecost. Only on the day of Pentecost. No leaven allowed on Passover. No leaven allowed on any other feast but Pentecost. Why? Because Pentecost speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And leaven speaks of sin. I hope some of you get that. If you don't, I'm sorry. I feel sorry for you. Leaven speaks of sin, and leaven was not in the bread on Passover because there was no sin there. He took upon him our sin. He destroyed our sin in the flesh. There's no sin on any other feast, not even the feasts of the other feasts that follow Passover except Pentecost. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's anointing belongs only to sinful men comes only upon sinners. That's why the leaven had to be in the bread. And the moment Jesus identifies himself with sinners, he's anointed. That hit me like, like, a, like, like a bomb. And he would be willing to identify with me like that. Lift your hands and thank him for his awesome mercy. The Holy Spirit anoints him on that blessed day of baptism. And heaven opens and the Holy Ghost descends like a dove. And God speaks and says, This is my well-beloved Son in whom I am blessed and well-pleased. On schedule. The Spirit of the Lord honoring that covenant. And never forget... Every covenant has conditions. Every covenant first has promises. Every covenant has conditions. And every covenant has a seal to it. The second covenant God made with man, just for your information, this is not even a part of my message, but for your information was the Adamic covenant. And the Adamic covenant was the only covenant that, that was not sealed because had it, had it been sealed, you and I could not have been saved. I think you probably lost what I just tried to say, so I'll explain it. God gave Adam promises. Every covenant has promises. And every promise has conditions. And the condition of the second covenant was, don't touch the tree. God gave him this massive house, the, whole, the entire size of the Middle East, he put two trees in that amazing house he had, a beautiful garden, the tree of life, and the knowledge of good and evil. And the knowledge of good and evil, I can assure you, was not apples. <laughs> Adam fell into sin, and God had to send cherubs to protect the tree of life. Why? Because had Adam eaten of the tree of life as a sinful man, you and I could not have been saved. We would have lived as sinners forever. No one would have died physically, would have lived on going forever as sinners. God protected our salvation by sending the cherubs of glory and protected the very elect. I'm going to take a little detour and come right back to what I'm talking about. In heaven are the five divisions of angels. You have the seraphs, six wings. One face, you have the cherubs, four wings, four faces, four little hands under each wing. You have the living creatures who are a combination of seraph, cherub, full of eyes. Everything is eyes. There's no hair on them, just eyes. Then you have the archangels, the angels of war. Then you have common angels, which are the only ones who've, who've ever been seen by men, except the cherub and seraphs have been seen by Isaiah and Ezekiel, and very, very few have ever seen them. And every division of angels is mind-blowing and staggering. You look at the seraph, you see six wings, one face, and with four wings he's covering himself, and two wings he flies. And covering yourself always speaks of worship, and flying always speaks of service, which means worship is double as important as service. And these are the angels that declare, holy, holy, holy in heaven. They're massive in size, and their voice shakes all of heaven itself. I'm glad I scared you. <laughs> hey, you're not too low. You've got to learn some, somehow, and sometimes 
you have to just kind of relax to really get it. <laughs> then you have the cherubs. Think about cherubs. I, this is like staggering for me, Pastor Gary. Four faces. Man, lion, ox, eagle on one head. Massive in size. Massive in size, Gregory. They, they are not the size of men. They are humongous in size. Nobody even knows how tall they stand. There's many arguments about that. Four humongous wings. And under every wing is a little hand like that. And they are the angels that protect the glory of God. And God sent those angels to protect my salvation. Wow. Then you have the living creatures full of eyes, known as the angels of judgment of Revelation 4. Wow. Imagine seeing them in heaven. Whew. That's why Paul said he could, not, he could not even talk about it. Then you have the archangels. Then you have the angels. And then you have these beings in glory who are just wheels. Nobody ever preaches on the wheels of glory. One day I think I will. Wheels. Living wheels. Think about wheels, choir. Massive. These things stand way high up. They almost went up almost to the sky when Ezekiel saw them. And think about wheels, within a wheels, within a wheel, full of eyes. <laughs> I mean, that just scary just to look on it. And four faces over the wheels, also full of eyes. You say, what are they? They are the wheels of glory. You say, what? Can you preach about it? I don't think you can even handle it. And everywhere the Holy Ghost goes, they follow. Everywhere the archangels go, they follow the Holy Ghost. And the sheriffs follow the Holy Ghost. He's the mighty power behind the angelic forces. Whoa. God Almighty made that glorious covenant in eternal past. And then he made the Adamic. And then he made the Noahic with Noah. Thank God that one was sealed. And then he made... Another one with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he made another one with Moses and the children of Israel. Then he made another one with David. And the final covenant is Jesus and his disciples. And the church. And everyone is sealed. And thank God this one is sealed with the Holy Ghost. Without the, without the Holy Ghost, there would be no covenants ever made. Every one of them was sealed by the Spirit. He's the power of the Godhead. And it's the Holy Spirit that came on that blessed day in the River Jordan, anointing him with power. It's because of the Holy Spirit that he preached. Do you realize Jesus could not have preached one sermon without him? For he said, the words that I speak are not my own. They are spirit and they are life. Everything he said came by the spirit. He said, if I, by the spirit of God, by the finger of God, cast out devils. Everything he, he did, everything he said by the spirit. Every miracle performed by the spirit. Without the Holy Ghost, no miracles would have happened. And the power of the highest, the power of God, was present to heal. Who is he? But the Holy Ghost. This blessed same Holy Spirit gives him power to endure. And on that last moment when Jesus took upon him my sin, and no one knows when that happened. I don't know. No one knows. No one can even guess because it's not, it's, it's not even written. All we know is the Holy Spirit departed before Jesus cried, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken? And the Holy Spirit leaves him. And there Jesus is on the cross by himself. He defeats. He destroys the power of Satan through the Spirit's power. But he destroyed Satan himself by himself. You don't know, but you have to know that when Jesus went into the underworld, he did not destroy the devil with the power of the Holy Ghost. He destroyed him with the power of his perfection. Mano a mano. 
The one that held the office of the first Adam faced the second Adam. And when Jesus faced him, he spoiled principalities and powers. And he destroyed him forever. And he rose from the dead victoriously. <laughs> By the power of the Holy Ghost. Had Jesus failed in his mission? And he could have. For he was as much man as though he was not. Had he failed? With strong crying, Hebrews writes, he cried out and cried out. Had he failed? His body would have remained intact in the grave. The Holy Ghost would not have raised him from the dead. Someone asked me one day, well, what do you mean by his body would have remained intact? I said, because his, his body never came out of dust. And if, if his body didn't come out of dust, what would it go back into? His body is the word of God. The word was made flesh. So therefore he had to rise from the dead. Thou will not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. There was no corruption in that body. No pollution in that body. Because that body is the word of God. And the Holy Ghost raised him from the grave. And for 40 days and 40 nights he gave commandments by the Spirit to his disciples. We seem to forget that part for it says he gave his instructions in Acts 1 by the Spirit. So he could not give them one instruction without the Holy Ghost telling him what to say to them. And he ascended to heaven, and a cloud received him. Well, who is the cloud? Who is he? The cloud is the Spirit. When Jesus comes back, who's going to bring him back? The Holy Ghost. He's going to come back on a cloud. And the cloud is the Holy Ghost. And when Jesus destroys the Antichrist, who will destroy the Antichrist? The breath of his mouth. Who is the breath of his mouth? The Holy Ghost. If Jesus is so dependent on the Holy Ghost. How about us? Nothing that happened to him happened without the Spirit. And here we're trying to do it on our own. Really? Without the Holy Ghost, there is no Christianity. He is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the Lord. And the Spirit is the Lord. And the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. No, no, no. We don't pray to him. He helps us pray. No, no. We don't call on him. He helps us call. He shall not testify of himself. He shall testify of me. He shall not glorify himself. He shall glorify me. He will not speak of, of himself. He will speak of me. The more you know the Holy Ghost, the more you know Jesus. And today the church is sliding towards a place of such death and defeat because most churches want nothing to do with him. But he's all I got. Without him, I'm sunk. One prayer I pray, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. When I went through that terrible scene in my life a few years ago, I would cry and weep, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And thank God he answered that prayer. Now lift your hands to heaven and call upon his name, Jesus. Jesus breaks every fetter. Jesus, he breaks Every fetter. Jesus breaks by the power of the Holy Ghost. He sets every man and every woman free. And it's always about Jesus. 